decision that it's going to be between about a half hour and 45 minutes, and to the extent that anyone would like to engage with the uh, panelists uh, in further conversation, you can do it over your favorite kind of beverage outside. Um, okay, so without further ado, uh, the, the final but by no means uh, last uh, speaker uh, today in today's session is Hugh Peters. Uh, Hugh uh, is another example of uh, an interesting career trajectory for uh, a lawyer. He started out as a lawyer. Uh, he was very entrepreneurial from the start in law school. Um, he was always interested in media. Um, he uh, had a very interesting early career and then became a uh, big muckety-muck at Walters Kluwer, uh, which most of you know is a, a global company based uh, in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, and a couple of years ago, Yuk uh, uh, split off from uh, Walters Kluwer and started his own very superb um, uh, international legal publication called Legal Business World. Um, Dean Dan Rodriguez has graced the cover of the magazine. Um, he's got some, Duke's got some really great writers. Um, and I think he does an absolutely terrific job of uh, very, very cogently covering uh, the legal waterfront um, from continent to continent. Um, and uh, uh, Northwestern's own Allison Carell will be uh, uh, his uh, moderator. Allison is, I'll make it short, Allison. Um, Allison uh, is both a mediator guru and she is also a legal tech expert uh, and has been uh, around the circuit and very well known and well regarded. So with that, um, you, uh, oh, one last thing. I said that um, John Fernandez was the co-winner of the Good Camper Award for coming here, you know, with two failed flights and everything. This is our other co-winner. Uh, you, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, had back surgery, and when I called him to see how he was and sort of expected that he was not gonna be able to show, I said, so I, I guess you're not gonna be able to show. He said, absolutely not, I'll be there. So I think a special round of applause to you, not only for coming to this, but on the show. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ty. Right, I, I think it doesn't work, is it? Hello? That, that's beyond my pay grade. Okay, welcome, my name is Yuk. Uh, a lot of you guys down here call me Joek. Uh, that's fine also. Uh, a special welcome also for what I know, because we, we're screaming right now, uh, some members of the Trans-European Law Firm Association and US Law Network, and my esteemed colleague, Alex Winterink, who is also in the stream. And um, I'm going to tell you well, take you with me. Let's see. Is it? Yes. Where do I push? Okay. okay. Oh, sure. Ah. So, live stream didn't happen. Oh. There we go. Very good. that I, I really don't know any other brand. <laughs> so. I will talk to you about understanding growth, but more understanding growth from uh, the, the enough, enough the perspective from, from, uh, from change and the behavioral issues behind growth. Um, uh, it's something where I think that all innovators, creators, but also all the legal professionals have to understand more about, have to understand more about themselves, how they react on change and things like that. So this is an introduction. I use this presentation for more, for more uh, venues. My name is Juk. My real name is Armand Alexander. My nickname is Juk, but everybody called me Juk from when I was that big, so it stayed Juk. Uh, born in Rotterdam. Lived at several places, went to Erasmus Law School, graduated there, uh, Tias Business School, uh, Etheridge, some postgraduate studies, etc., etc., etc. Very interesting, but more interesting is that I really love sailing, skiing, and creating things. Um, that innovation is part of my life, it is that uh, I looked at in it, and you see that I was 
well, engaged in 64 in innovation, innovative, innovative projects so far. 26 innovative developments, which I was responsible for, for were my own. From those 26, 14 were successful. Five were complete misses, complete failures, really. And seven were second stage successes. And seven, uh, se second stage successes are, for instance, the, the SK platform for the Dutch police. What we did is we agreed upon with senior management in the Dutch police to build this platform with all the knowledge and information uh, officers needed. So we built a very nice platform on the internet and, and with, with all the information, the practicalities, and you, you name it. And at, when we launched the product, only 8% of the total Dutch police corps used the product. And most of them used paper. And that's one thing you, I've learned from innovation. Sometimes you have a good idea, but you don't actually talk with the people who actually used the innovation. And what we learned is that the Dutch police was not always behind the desks. They were on the street patrolling. And at the time they needed the information, they had to have internet access. This was in 98. So what we did to make it a second stage success is that we gave those officers on the street, what you, there, were, there were smartphones that, that time, we gave them the, those uh, PDAs, HP had PDAs. So we gave them those PDAs and they could uh, uh, get the information they needed on the PDA. So at first it was a miss, but the second stage was, it was a real success. Well, there are some, some things on it. Second stage success is Smartox, for instance. Smartox is a, a sales budget agreement uh, we developed with Ellen Overy. Uh, it was a very, well, I think, very good product. But there was one thing which, which didn't, well, work in the, in the legal market and especially work with the legal professional. And that was that smart dogs, in the end, when you have a merger and acquisition, you need a legal team on it. And especially the big merger and acquisitions needs a lot of legal, legal uh, uh, expertise. Smart dogs was, 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 uh, was, was a product which actually uh, uh, connected this, the party who was sold, or the merger, or the acquisition, with the legal team at, for instance, Helen Overy. And what Smartox did was that, the, in, in the end, Smartox uh, was, a, was a, a tool that increases the efficiency, but also said, well, you don't need a big legal team anymore. And for instance, Helen Overy was, uh, with this team of, of approximately 15 lawyers, and they only needed six lawyers because the tooling helped them with being more efficient, being more effective, and in the end, we thought, well, now we have the holy solution in sales purchase agreement, and especially for big law, but nobody bought it. And why is it a second stage success? I was still working at Walter Kluwer, and this thing was developed by the quiet law company. Uh, I was an advisor for this company. And the second stage success came when we integrated the product into the suite Walter Kluwer sold already to the, to the legal professionals in the market. The, the, the second, second thing we uh, uh, learned was that the, the, the the creation of smaller teams wasn't something that all the law firms really liked. Because there was this status thing, and there was this uh, thing of being able to, to, to show your client that you're working with a big team in a project was also so, sort of a security for a big bill. So by actually creating a smaller team and a big bill, that did, didn't feel right for them. So that was also one of the reasons the SBA had itself, that the tooling didn't work. It worked in the Kluwer application because we had a lot of users in this application. So it was a sort of an add-on. And uh, uh, it was not, the, 
the, the, the, the, the standalone product anymore. And uh, it was just part of a suite, so less harmful. Yeah. Mm. Innovation change, changing legal markets, no nutshell, characteristics and behavior, etc., etc. We all know that the, uh, the market changes, and we all know things that drive change. You see some examples that drive change. This was from a research done in 2017. And we all know that somewhere around 2000, we had the, 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 the increase of the IT into the legal in, uh, segment. We all know that 2008 was it. We had financial crisis, and the uh, clients rejected to pay the big bills anymore, and asked for new solutions. Um, I would say, legal professionals, they have all the ingredients to become master in change, and that's because they have competencies. They learn to have competencies. They learn at high school. To, to, to act in, ch in a changing environment. Um, uh, they learn to work in changing circumstances with changing conditions. That's one of the features. Every lawyer needs to work in a, in a, in a, with a changing circumstances, changing conditions in a case, uh, changing legislation and regulation. Uh, you know, uh, on a daily basis, we have changes in regulation and, and, and legislation. So they learn to, to, to work with those changes. They have to be creative. If you're not creative, it's probably you will be well, less of a good lawyer. You have to be creative to win. So you have to be open for change and, and, and work with change yourself. And perseverance is very important. You have to go on and try, go on, go on, and try to find something new or try to find something else especially in litigation cases. Find something that the other party didn't find. find. And um, those, those are ingredients, characteristics, which every innovator needs. And um, we, all, we all also know that we typecast the legal profession as change averse. And that's, that's really strange. Because they have all the ingredients to become change masters, and still, this market, the old presentations we saw, it, is, it's like they are change averse. Change is something, well, scary, almost. Um, and that's because what I think, in my opinion, is that uh, 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 we just had it about the ability to adapt. Mankind has the ability to, to adapt, but there is a flaw in this blueprint, blueprint and that uh, that's, he is a bad change agent. Uh, even highly innovative people are bad in, in some way in changing. And that's one thing is that's because of their comfort zone. Comfort zone is something which is, yeah, is almost uh, um, destructive in change. Leaving your comfort zone is very important. Hmm? But still, it's also very, very difficult. Why leave your comfort zone? Why, why if, if you're feeling great and, and, and everything is going well, and you know, uh, we make money, and well, we had this financial crisis, but we still have bills keep on going, and well, it's, it's, it's going fine right now. So why change? Why leave our comfort zone? Because somebody is, Ross tells me that I can be more efficient? I don't know. Status, very important status. It's something everybody has. Some people have it more than, than others, but status. And a nice example is that we once introduced a tool that this lawyer could work with only one secretary, one assistant. It didn't, it didn't sell at all. And that was because we didn't look at the actual driver behind his being. And the actual driver was that he, he, was, he was proud to have two or three assistants. And that it was a status thing. So those guys came with a, with a tooling which was more efficient and you name it. 
But he didn't like that. It was, it was, it was diluted on his status. So that's, that's a very important thing to know, that leaving your comfort zone, status, the time frame. We are not good in uh, 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 accepting a lot of change in a small time frame. It's hard for us to deal with. We, we, we need some, some kind of structure. Uh, we, we, we need structure. Uh, we, we need uh, to know where we're going to. Uh, man, mankind is not good. We can adapt to change, but we're not good in change. And especially not if there's too much change. And we saw in the last pres presentation, there is a lot of change going on right now. So you can imagine that it's very difficult for people, legal professionals, to, to accept all the changes and to be your front. Leave their comfort zone, leave the status, and accept that there's more change in this time frame that I actually want. Failure. We are very afraid of failure. Um, Failure is, is, is a thing that um, nobody, nobody likes to talk about, about uh, failures. We don't, we don't like negative input. We don't like people talking about, well, uh, you, you, if you say, hi, how are you? You expect good, fine, whatever. You don't expect, well, as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, I, I have this project and it's a total failure and I'm not feeling good <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, that's, that's not the objective of how are you. The objective of how are you is, well, good, fine, thank you, how are you? Well, I'm good, yeah, yeah. How's business? Oh, successful. Yeah, yeah. Getting along, and you? Yeah, well, mm. We don't talk about failure. And that's, that's, that's typical, because we can learn a lot of failure, you know? And by sharing failure, we, we can learn to, to actually to grow and that's that's very important that what we all want is growing when we were a child you always looked at your big brother or somebody you want to be like that you had those peer group behavior uh, that some something was good or in the time I was little uh, it was very in that you for instance you you wore a, a, a McGregor jeans with, with a Scottish uh, Scottish uh, uh, designs on it, and everybody wanted that because then you, well, you were one of the successful ones. Uh, so it didn't have to do anything about actual growth. It's what in your mind growth is who you want to be. And I remember for myself that I once said when I was at university, well, I want to, I want to uh, earn. Uh, 100k, and then I will be happy and uh, stop and maybe do something what I really like. Actually, when I earned 100k, I thought, well, it would be nice that I earn 200k. What do I have to do? And 200k it would be nice to earn even more. So the thing I had in, had in my mind in growth terms was earnings again and again and again but the actual growth my, my personal growth and growth in, in in what I did had nothing to do with earnings and uh, especially at those growth the, those large corporates where I was working um, you can grow in earnings by doing what they want you to do, not by, not by doing what is the best. And that's, that's also one thing you have to keep in mind. So comfort zone, status, time frame, failure, it's very important that you understand and that you are clear to yourself and, and, and that you realize that those things are really things that matter and change. In, in accepting innovative products, in, in, in creating things, in growth. So the acceptance is the first step, first step in, in, in your personal growth, but also in your business growth. Acceptance that those things matter. 
And the last one was communication. I think that's one who, which is very important. Mm. It's communicating. We, as mankind, are very bad communicators. It's, it's unbelievable. And we have this, this well, uh, ability, uh, this competency of willing to hear what we want to hear. And uh, that's something with innovation, which and innovative products, or selling innovative products, or accepting innovative products, or your client relation, which is very important. Because most of the times, the guy or girl on the other side of the desk, your client, they, they probably not, and they probably say, well, yeah, I understand you. But they understand only five to 50% of what you say. And they, un they only understand what is important for themselves. And nobody asks, okay, do you understand what I'm saying? And that the other 75% of your message is also clear. If a client tells you, well, I'm fine with it, it's very interesting, and yeah, I think there's a possibility that we will work together, yeah, you're happy, and you leave. But sustainable growth, sustainable innovation, is about 75% that isn't in the conversation. That's learning about what he actually, what drives him. So, in knowing all those things, status, comfort zone, and things like that, you can act, uh, uh, um, uh, you, you can be more transparent in actually uh, dealing with those, with those things in your life. And if change is happening, what I always did was I told the troops where I was responsible for that there probably will be a lot of persons who, were, who didn't agree on the change, who didn't, uh, they, they, they didn't feel like leaving their comfort zone. Or maybe status was an issue. I don't know. So what I said was, well, look here. We know if we want, if we want to grow, we have to change something. And okay, maybe nowadays you don't see that change is inevitable because you're feeling fine, you're making your, your profits and whatever. But we know that, for instance, if we are a law firm, that if we don't use tech to be more efficient, if we do it the, the, the way we always did it, uh, get another assistant, get more secretaries, uh, increase your team, and things like that, uh, that won't work. Another thing is that you also know that we're in, in this, this thing called dynamics. The market is definitely <coughs> dynamic. And dynamics is almost synonymous with change. Um, if a market is very stable, there are no almost no dynamics. Yeah. You can say in your comfort zone probably, and that's what the legal professional did for years and years on. Uh, they did the same thing, the billable hour, partnership structures worked, so why change it? Clients didn't ask for it, nobody asked, so you go on. But you know by heart, because every industry, every, everything in the world, uh, 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 from the industrial, uh, industrial uh, revolution on, there is change, and at the end you accept it. So what I did was I, told them about the grief cycle, or their psychological re resilience, how far they could bounce back on negative messages. And what I told them about the grief cycle is that probably uh, you're in your comfort zone now, the stand, you like the status you have, uh, you, feel, you feel fine, you like your earnings and things like that, and probably you're gonna say, you're gonna, uh, say why, why change? and there will be immobilization, you will be angry, and it costs you a lot, a lot of time, all those stages. Uh, but in, at the end, it's a question, do you want to work here and be part of the change? Because otherwise, don't stay here, find something else. 
because it, it, it is really annoying for yourself. All those phases, being angry, telling, telling your, your family that they're, they're out of control at your office, or that, that what they now thought of is, is really ridiculous. We're doing fine, it's, it's unbelievable. But yet if you want to stay at that office, you want to stay working there, and they're in this change project, you have to accept it. And by having all those emotions in time, which you see down here, and accepting those emotions, and knowing about those emotions, helps you to decline the time frame. And, and, and it's okay that to be angry, but don't stay angry. And, and, and I accept that if you go through all the ups and downs, it will cost you a lot of time. And it will cost the change a lot of time. And the effect stays out for a longer time. But by knowing that you will suffer from those strange emotions, it helps you, in the end, to change. And so I told my team, always told my team, she probably will have these feelings or talk about these things. And it's okay. But I'm wondering if we work together and we accept the change, we probably save time and we probably know much earlier what's it all about and what's in it for me and how the change works, works out. And curious was that be, before I told people things like this, you had those long time frames and ups and downs in the organization, and people were talking shit about you as a manager and whatever. Uh, and by telling them, I learned that the time space in, 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 in the change management tra uh, trajectory was, was less long. And we were more effective in a short time. Acceptance of dynamics. I was talking about it. Dynamics, you know, the, the, the legal market has become a dynamic market. From a client perspective, uh, from a perspective of how the legal profession develops, from even an educational perspective, there, everywhere there's that dynamics. It's not a traditional market anymore. When, when, I was going, when, when I was in law school, where you, if you study hard and knew a lot about those practices, and uh, for instance, if you want to be, become a court lawyer, a tax lawyer, re study really hard in those tax issues, jurisprudence, legislation, uh, you probably would become a, f a fine lawyer, a very good lawyer. Nowadays, the market is not that stable anymore. And uh, there, again, back to the presentation of, uh, of the, 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 I don't know who, who made us, those, you, you, you made the name in your presentation of all the changes that were happening. Telegram. Ah, okay. You see that probably the market dynamics will only increase. And that's good. And what you also see is that the market, the legal market, has become a mature market, a more mature market, like is retail, like, like other markets, like the, the, the medical market, for instance. Um, uh, and I find that very, very accelerating. I think that's, that's great. All those dynamics, you know. Uh, it, it, it really makes my heart tick, and it really is, is, is invigorating. It's, it's, it's nice. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's fun to see that we don't know, exactly know where we're going to. And um, not saying that I also have those things as comfort zone and, and probably status. Because it's, it's fun, it's very nice, warm to be in comfort zone. But then again, on the other hand, you know, there's, there's something going on right now. And what I hope for is by telling people about change, about the effects and why they, they, they find it so difficult to change by, so that they can accept their own behavior in this, that we all, well, with small steps, 
embrace the change, which is coming right now. And it's, uh, it's oh, the way around. Apple doesn't have those things. <laughs> Reactive versus proactive. Very important. Reactivity was, was, uh, was, was very important in the legal market. Looking back, what, what happened, uh, anticipating on what happened once. Because, uh, yeah, especially in litigation, there must be something wrong, and it's always in the past. We take a look at it, and we're very good in, in analyzing the problem and things like that. Well, I think all legal professionals must be, become more proactive. And of course, in their core legal profession, they, 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 they have those reactive skills, which are very important. But proactivity is, is, is very important in innovation and change and acceptance of it. Um, uh, acting before the situation becomes a source of confrontation or crisis. Um, I know that we, as lawyers, we, we sometimes thrive on crisis and confrontation. But in terms of market growth, it's better that you try to be proactive and, 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 and your proactivity and, and try to be that also with your client. Um, so taking into account that uh, all those things matter in your own behavior, comfort zone, status, uh, know that if change is happening that there will be stages of grief knowing that you probably will not that will be that uh, resilience in, in accepting negativity, uh, knowing that you're probably more a reactive kind of guy or girl, human, uh, than a proactive, um, helps you, in the end, helps you to accept change and helps you to become part of this change in my opinion. Uh, start acting. I'll give you a demo. Oh, start acting. Um, what I mean by that is knowing that the market is dynamic, knowing all those things I talked about is, for instance, that if you're a vendor, a product supplier, a vendor, you also can be a vendor if you're a legal professional, a lawyer, uh, and it's kind of the general counsel or corporate counsel, whatever. The purchase buyer can be the law firm, can be the general counsel, or whatever. <coughs> um, knowing all those things I talked about, and then learn from your leads, prospects, and ask is very important as a vendor. Because probably uh, there are, you, you, you don't precisely know what his challenges are. If you have a proposition like Rose has, and you try to sell it as the, 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 the end proposition. This is what it is, this is what you get. Well, you probably will, won't be successful. So that's also what I learned, and we talked about it, that working with launching customers, learn from the innovation, learn from the product, learn from the change, and, 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 and ask the client who is working with it what he thinks of it, what he likes different, and why. So learn from it. it will be more successful than sort of an off-the-shelf dump in the market and try to sell it. Because the sustainability of those sales will be, well, very low. Don't sell futures, very important. Walk the walk, talk the talk. Um, salespeople are very good in uh, selling futures. Uh, and I know a lot of lawyers who mastered the, the art of selling themselves as sort of a future. Selling things that they don't know precisely if they can, uh, uh, if they can, uh, uh, how do you say it, uh, uh, deliver what they told, but they think about their firm behind them and they have this mindset, well, I go back to the firm and I will tell them, well, we probably have this client, but we have to do this, that, and that. But it's a 100K or, or, or a million K client, so 
And the firm says, well, of course, and they go back and they try to fix those problems. And at the end, the client is the one who thinks he has a solution, but the solution is not what he probably uh, uh, thought he would, would, would get. So don't sell futures because futures and sustainability in your deal or are, aren't that good. Except that the other party is not an expert in your area of expertise. Very important. Still nowadays, and it's something which is going on for 10 years right now, is that you have this typical person, it's called an IT professional, who sells what he thinks about, what he created, to somebody who's not in IT. In, in Holland, we talk about the beta people who sell to alphas. Uh, people who are not uh, uh, into to, to the, the technical art. And um, uh, if what I saw, for instance, at Lexpo, there was this, 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 uh, this innovation summit at Lexpo in, in Amsterdam. And I talked to the, the purchasers of software products, and I talked to some firm leaders over there. And when I asked the firm leaders, what do you think about all the products which are here and, 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 and the legal tech? It's, isn't it amazing? Yeah, 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 sure is. But everybody tells me, if I, if I ask something, everybody tells me, yeah, we can do that. We have three vendors who, who sell e-discovery solutions. And all three, can do everything I want. So how do I choose? From the IT perspective, it's normal. Because if you ask somebody who develops IT solutions, and you say, is it possible that you develop, within this e-discovery solution, you develop a certain customer relationship management tool, because we work like this and this, the IT professional probably will say, yeah, sure. No problem at all. And he sees a challenge for himself, you know, because he knows that there are probably tooling or packages or whatever that he can embed into this product. And this product becomes more and more viable and more, more invigorating. So he says, yeah, yeah, of course it can. And by not seeing that probably the other side, the firm leader, doesn't have a clue what he is thinking about, how he thinks, there is no, no, no real commitment. And you probably will have a project with, well, it, it may succeed, it will cost a lot of money, it will cost a lot of effort. And it's the same way or, uh, the other way around, except that the other party is not an expert in your expertise. Um, we as lawyers, we tend to think that we are very good communicators, and we are very good in telling what we want. Um, and we are uh, skilled in communication. We are skilled in how to bring a message. So when we talk with an IT vendor, an IT vendor, sorry, or uh, somebody else, um, we think we are masters in giving those guys, the message, all the specs that we really want. It's sort of an arrogance. I think we, le we learn in high school, sorry, uh, Dan. Uh, uh, we learn in high school that because we, we, learn, to, we, we learn to think different, we, we learn all those things of how to, how to uh, uh, come to, to an, an actual understanding. We know tricks, how to... Uh, 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 impress people on the other side, or maybe to uh, sort of a cognitive dissonance way uh, uh, how we how we act to to clients. We learn how to uh, 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 well, actually, to win the case for them. What case that is? Be transparent and have an open mindset. Transparency is also something which is very hard for a lot of law firms. Um, uh, transparency also is admitting that you don't know precisely what is going on, and especially in legal tech. And I will show you later on that in, uh, in a research study we did, is that 
uh, transparency really is an issue. And one of the law firm lawyers, a um, uh, big law firm, which actually was in the pre presentation, um, uh, he told us, well, it's, it's not sexy to admit that you're not really into legal tech developments. And it's, for us, it's easier also to talk as if it is sort of a peer group thing to talk about that legal tech is important. Uh, and it's not sexy that we have other challenges also in our company. Challenges of business modeling, for instance. We come to that later. So it's very important knowing that you are probably in a comfort zone, that you leave your comfort zone. It's very important that status, you know, you will reach some kind of status, but it also will, will fade away. Uh, knowing that there is change, that you have to accept that the market is dynamic, that you have to do something in dynamic markets to survive. Knowing all those things, knowing that, the, that your client or your vendor is probably talking a different language. Be open and ask for him, ask what he exactly means. Be transparent. Confront him with your uncertainties. Very important. Confront. If I go to Ross Intelligence, for instance, and I say, well, you know, everybody tells me that you are doing something incredible. But if I'm honest to myself, I really don't understand what you're doing. And that's something which is very important. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of people don't dare to say it. Yeah. And that's, that's something we all have to remind ourselves. And that's something where we'll end this presentation, is dare. I think it's very important that we challenge ourselves. Dare to understand, et cetera, et cetera. Mute. Yeah. I just want to let you take some time to share, share with them the, your survey results. OK. OK. Well, the service. Very quick. We did a survey in. 22 countries. In each country, we had 60 to, 100, uh, to 120 people who were in this survey. And we asked them simple questions. We asked them, what topics do you really find interesting? And what do you think are the most important topics to read about? Well, first is legal tech, opinions by experts and thought leaders, marketing, finance, privacy and law, and business development. Uh, it differs a little bit in the countries, but that was if you if you take the global community in those 22 countries, you, this this is almost the ranking. Our data, however, show that legal tech one was on three. So the same people who proclaimed that legal tech was the most important thing to read about actually. We're looking at opinions by experts and thought leaders, how the market evolves. We publish a lot from uh, Mark. Thank you for that. Um, uh, and Mark, as a thought leader, talks about different, different things. He talks about legal delivery. He talks about HR, about all, the, all, all those subjects. So you see that there is a discrepancy between what they think is important and what they say is important and what they actually read. I have one note, legal tech by thought leaders is also legal tech. But if we, if we uh, look at the sum of everything, it's still that the opinion, then two, business development, three, legal tech, four, marketing and HR, and five, finance are very important. Um, to learn more about why they gave those answers, we talked with them on a personal basis. And what you see is that, for instance, legal tech developments still uh, are a black box for a lot of professionals. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to miss out. So that's why I read about it and say I read about it. But I find it sometimes find it very hard to understand. Um, what we also heard was, heard was how far legal tech actually offers a broad solution. Uh, we heard that legal tech was perceived as a competitor, and especially in smaller law firms, because we looked at small, large, and not at the really big law firms, only a few. 
four. I can't uh, tell you more about it because it's maybe a little bit confronting. Um, what you also heard was uh, legal tech is an overhyped thing because we still have to solve other problems in our business. And most of the people we interviewed told us things like uh, cybersecurity, for instance. It's really a, a European thing. Uh, we, we, we talked about the GDPR. Uh, but cybersecurity, HR, talent management, very important. Uh, business modeling. And uh, we know we have uh, alternative fee arrangements. Uh, we still work with billable hours. But what can we do? What can we find to actually have a general counsel at the other side of the table who is really into our proposition and also likes our fee arrangements we have? Um, very important. It's not appreciated to discuss performance uh, versus organizational structure. A lot of young lawyers in this interview told us that, well, it's very hard to talk about change because of the older, the firm leaders, the older guys at our office, they don't like to, that we discuss their organizational structure. They don't like that we discuss legal tech as a possibility to be more efficient. It's very hard to actually to, to, to learn them that legal tech is not something you must be afraid of. And legal tech is not something uh, where you talk about failure or success. And there is a, a, an enormous difference between the young students nowadays at law school, the young lawyers, and then you have the more arrived group of lawyers. Take some time for um, for folks to uh, ask you some questions as well. Sure. So I think we've only sure. got about five minutes left, and I know Mark is ready to get to that panel and okay. cocktail hour. Yeah. So uh, one thing I want to want to conclude with is dare. I'll give them to you. Oh. I think what is very important is that we all, as legal professionals, one way or the other that we dare to start a fire. Think about how to start this fire, you know? Think about it, dare. And if you don't dare, you will probably, well, you, you, you won't be part of the solution at all. Dare to start something new. Dare to accept uh, uh, and, and learn from failure. Very important. You know, you, it, it's, it's great to have failure. It learns you a lot. Dare to be curious. No, even if you're your firm leader or the old guys say, wow, well, don't, don't bother, dare to be curious, dare to challenge yourself, dare to be disruptive, not in action maybe, but in mindset, and, and, and dare to open your mouth, because all those dares will probably help you to accept change. So dare to accept change and be aware of that you're not this defined Blorp, protoplasma, you know, uh, which uh, uh, is in, on this world, and uh, well, only there to, to, to act as you think people want you to act. So, so before we open it up um, for a question, I just you talk a lot about the disconnect, uh, you between what is part of the legal profession, change, creativity, and yet the comfort of lawyers with change, creativity. You talk about the disconnect between um, within your survey of what people say they want to learn and what they're actually reading, right? Um, you started out this presentation sharing a lot of, um, I think as you described in our conversation earlier this week, innovation mishaps. Yeah. Um, but what you said, dared and fail, so failures. Um, can you share a story about a success and what um, we might glean from that so that when we feel comfortable with failure, what we can hang on to to approach potential success? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, maybe it's better. I, I, That's fine. I back. Yeah, I'll sit, though. <laughs> I will share a non-legal tech success. And that's in, in, in uh, one of the successes uh, from when I was a, a law student. We 
thought it was time for the legal profession, because it was all serious, to develop a glossy lifestyle magazine for the legal profession. And we did so. So we made a magazine and we looked at things like the Playboy, where you have the pin-up. And we made a pin-up with a, uh, 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 our, our, our uh, uh, director of the Bar Association with clothes on. <laughs> with clothes on. But also the, 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 the similar questions as you see in Playboy. So what are your hobbies? Uh, what do you really want? Uh, change the world, things like that. And we did. We, we made a glossy magazine of uh, uh, in, uh, personal interest stories and things like that. And what was really nice is that if we asked people if they know this this magazine called the Jurist in, in Dutch, uh, all those legal professionals said, oh, "No, no, I've never, never read it." And it was controlled circulation, so it, it was in a you know, uh, um, every, we, we, we send it to everybody. But never, no, nobody read it. But if you were talking about stories, were in the magazine, everybody knew it. And everybody knew that this, this pin up of the month was the, 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 the director of the Bar Association or the, the, the managing partner uh, of Baker McKenzie and things like that. So, um, what we learned from that is that. Uh, uh, in terms of acceptance, is that you sometimes you, you have to ask and you have to look further because this magazine. <coughs> at first, we thought it was a total failure, but because we learned that everybody read those stories, we suddenly saw that the magazine was a, was a, was a success, and we only. So it depended conclusion. on what you were measuring as success, what success they were looking for. Yeah, that everybody read it, and for us that we could say our advertisers, look here, everybody reads the magazine. You're actually reading it. Yeah.